Hi, in this video, we want to look at Bayesian exploratory factor analysis. All right, so in factor analysis, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to, well, let me back up. In explain or exploratory factor analysis, I believe that under the hood, in an unobserved manner, there are variables that are driving the observed data. And what I want to do, I want to find what those variables are, and I want to establish what's the connection with my observed data. Okay, so in, in statistics, we generally have two major approaches, frequentist approach statistics, that's classical statistics, and we also have Bayesian statistics. All right, so Bayesian statistics, what it does, it takes in prior information, prior knowledge, either that's from subject matter experts describing you know, what's going on, or that comes from previous analytics that people have ran. And we want to incorporate you know, this information into the model that we're about to build. All right, so Bayesian statistics has a lot of good features. It gives a very complete description of, of our model. Um, we get very, very comprehensive view of what's going on if we want to dig deep enough and scratch the surface and get into it. And there's a lot of flexibility in Bayesian statistics and flexibility that we don't really have when we do uh, frequent statistics because the uh, pr prior posterior paradigm induces the inclusion of prior distributions induces some flexibility that we wouldn't have otherwise. There are some disadvantages though. First and foremost, some people are resistant to this. Well, why is that? Well, Bayesian statistics has the opportunity to be abused. And because of this, there are some statisticians that just reject it altogether. My experience is that these are usually the older classically trained statisticians, but this resistance in my experience is like fading away over time. We have the additional task of declaring prior distributions, which means that somehow we need to know something of what's going on you know, for us to be able to really do Bayesian statistics. One that I've encountered professionally is computation time increases and it increases quite a bit. We also have the increased risk of non-convergent computations. And so I usually look at this as an indication that I have bad model structure. So remember, if my, it takes a long time for my model to converge, I probably have a bad data model combination, which usually means I have bad data or I, I have a bad model for the data or both maybe. Since it's more comprehensive uh, of output, it can also be more difficult to interpret. Yeah. And so if I have more stuff to work with, I have to wade through it. And that could be a disadvantage. And biostatistics, bi Bayesian statistics can be abused to get the desired output. How does this happen? Well, the person who is doing the study, running the statistics, what they can do, they can pick a uh, prior distribution that the central tendency, the mean median mode, connects with what they want the output to be. Then what they do, they, uh, with the prior distribution, they pick one that has very, very, very narrow variance. And by doing that, what this does, the variance in the Bayesian prior distribution is kind of like the amount of influence that that distribution gets. And then the number of observations is the amount of influence, roughly, and this is roughly speaking, the amount of influence our data has. And so when we build the posterior model, the two come together and, you know, it's kind of like, you can think of it as kind of like a weighted average aspect, though there isn't like a nice clean equation that could put these together. Well, if I crank up the precision that is the inverse of variance on my prior distribution, the variance will shrink down and it'll have more influence. And so if I really go nuts with this, I can make it so that my data practically has no influence in the posterior model in my Bayesian statistics. So this is something to watch out for. Basically what you want to do when you read Bayesian statistics is you just wanna look at the prior and you wanna make sure that they're not cranking up the variance to force it into or crank, sorry, cranking down the variance to force it into being what they want it to be.
All right, here we're going to load the data. So here we're looking at some views on uh, privacy online. And we have two categories of questions. We have advantages and we have disadvantages. And you know, so we have 100, or sorry, 405 individuals. We have 10 variables. And you know, there's just like statements about uh, how much they agree or disagree with the statement. So let's load the data. I'm going to go ahead and reduce the output to be just two digits visually. That way uh, I don't get like overwhelmed when I print anything. We're going to use a privacy data set from the modern psychometrics with R. And then we're going to scale our data. OK, scaling our data. This is an important step. Anytime, oh, virtually every time that I do principal component analysis, factor analysis, or cluster analysis, almost every single time I want to rescale my data. Why is this? Well, if I don't do this, the columns that have greater standard deviation will have more influence on the model. That might be great, but if you know, out of the box, I don't know how much influence I want each one to have, I probably want them to all be equal. So what will happen if there is one column that has much greater standard deviation than all of the others, the, the model that I'm running on is basically gonna look at that one column and virtually ignore the rest. So I don't want that to happen in this situation, so I'm rescaling. Now times that I won't rescale, even though morally I want to, is times that, like let's say, I have data and all the observations are 0, 1, 2. And every, every column goes from 0, 1, 2. And so everything's on the same scale. And in that situation, standard deviation is not such a big deal. Uh, so I'll just leave it like that way. Uh, I'll leave it as is. That way it's easier to interpret. So a disadvantage of scaling is that the interpretation changes, you know, because I am subtracting off the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. All right, so now let's look at the correlation in the data. Here, I'm gonna use the core plot package. I'm gonna use core plot mixed because what I want in my core plot, I want ellipses up top, numbers down low, and I'm gonna go ahead and use Pearson correlation because that's what the author of the textbook used. Um, yeah, I could use any correlation possible, but I'm choosing Pearson here. And so here, when I look at this, it's very clear to me that there are basically two like clusters, two groups of correlation. And here the, we have the advantages and we have the disadvantages. When I look at the, so how am I picking that out? I'm going by the blue square or this, like this big square of blue and this big square of blue. And you'll notice that here I have weaker correlations. Well, the, this is the correlation between the advantages and the disadvantage. Uh, columns. And up here are the ellipses. If I come down here, if I reflect over the diagonal, the diagonal is the red letters, I can see the numbers for the correlation. So here I can see that this is a pretty, this is relatively to the rest, a strong correlation. And here's the number that goes with it, 0.73, not really a strong correlation, but you know, it's the strongest one of this batch. And then it looks like this is probably the second strongest correlation of 0.56. And then if I look at these numbers, I can see overall that the correlations between the advantages and disadvantages columns is rather weak, nearly zero. So right now, just out of the box, I'm thinking there's probably two factors, advantages, disadvantages. Let's see what happens. All right, so now what I want to do when I do my Bayesian statistics, I'm gonna to need to establish what are the minimum number of observed uh, variables I want to have connecting to our under the hood Latin variables. And I need to say, what's the maximum number of under the hood variables, uh, latent factors that I'm willing to have in my model? All right, so what we do here, and I'm just, I'm running with the, the author's decisions, is that I'm saying, hey, I want at least two observed variables connecting to every single factor, and I want, no more than five factors total. If there's more than five factors, 
I'm not even going to accept it. I believe that five is the most that I'm actually going to have. All right, so now what I want to do, I want to get some intuition into the degrees of freedom for one of the parameters we're going to work with. All right, so when I establish my prior distribution, I'm going to need to get a prior distribution for the correlation matrix, All right? So I use a correlation matrix to fit the, uh, the, the factor analysis. Okay, well, one thing that we're doing in Bayesian statistics is I establish not observed values, but I establish a distribution of values. Well, here it's gonna be, a, I want a distribution of correlation matrices. Correlation matrices are n by n matrices. I can't just like off the top of my head visualize, you know, a multi-dimensional thing like that. All right, so, and also, I mean, they've they, they got some relatively complicated structure in there. They're, you know, they're gonna be semi-positive definite or positive definite. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm like not comfortable just like picking something. So what I want to do, I want to just take a look at what prior distributions would be reasonable and then, you know, try to make an informed decision on what my prior will be. So I'm gonna use the Bayes FM package I'm going to use the simulation R prior function. And what this is going to do, this is going to generate correlation matrices given certain distribution parameters. Then I'm going to take all of those randomly generated matri uh, correlation matrices and I'm going to look at their features to see what looks appropriate for what I believe I should be getting, what, what I believe should be the right distributions on things like eigenvalues. All right, and what we're gonna do, what we need to identify the degrees of freedom parameter of the inverse which are prior on the correlation or covariance matrices, sorry. I've been saying correlation, it's covariance. They're related, there is a difference. All right, so what we're gonna do, I'm gonna say K max is five. So I'm saying, no more than five factors. And then I'm going to go ahead and go over the uh, degrees of freedom. And I'm just going to look at reasonable values. And so we're going to look at 6, 7, 10, 12, and 15. I'm taking K max plus these values. OK? So you notice that we're making sure that every single time the degrees of freedom is greater than the number of factors I'm gonna be using. And so I run the code and we get, you know, it, it uh, runs through and gives me the distribution. Well, this output doesn't really tell me what's going on. So now let's go ahead and look a little bit more closely. Let's look at the correlations and the eigenvalues. So here, Remember, I'm going to have as, ma as, many, uh, as many vectors I have, as many columns I have in my data set, I'm going to have that many rows and columns on my covariance matrix. OK, well, that's a lot of numbers each and individual time. It's hard for me to interpret what's going on. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to look at some summary statistics to give me an idea of what's going on. So the first one we're going to look at is the maximum correlation on each of these randomly generated uh, uh, covariance matrices. And then after that, I'm going to look at eigenvalues. And so here, this corresponds to the distribution. And here are the mean, median, standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and quantiles of the maximum correlation on the n by n matrix. And so for each distribution generating random values, we get to see we, uh, we have statistics on that. Okay, so gives me an idea of what's going on. Does it seem reasonable to have a maximum very an average maximum variation of 0.82? Does it seem reasonable to have a, ma a maximum correlation of 0.5? I would say probably not. I would say something a little bit higher, more than likely, but we'll, we'll keep on looking. Now let's look at the eigenvalues. And so the eigenvalues, if I look at the average of the eigen, eigenvalues, 
we can see that we have 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.26, and so on. And I can look through at each of these individual values. If I see a difference between mean and median, that means I have a skewed distribution, or not, doesn't mean it, it's it consistent with a skewed distribution. Not seeing much of a difference. There is a little bit, but not, that's not a lot to worry about. All right, so now let's actually look at the distribution of maximum correlation and the distribution of minimum eigenvalues. And so we can see that our correlation, absolute value is gonna go from zero to one, right? Now, if I don't really have a strong knowledge of what's going on, I want something very general, something very vague, I don't want to bias my results. So in that case, I want larger variance and I would like to have a central tendency that is closer to the middle. Okay, so when I look at the correlations here, maximum correlation, I can see that this is relatively close to the middle. It's a little bit bigger, but that's fine. It is a maximum, right? And it looks like it's got decent variation. If I look at the blue, you can see that, that is, that's gonna be favoring having a larger maximum correlation each time, which that may not be what I actually want. Similarly, I can look at the eigenvalues. Now, minimum eigenvalues, the eigenvalues are distributed this way. And like the shorter curve, the curves that are lower down uh, at the peak when it's uh, unimodal will be generally the ones that have greater variance. And so we can see that the red and the yellow and the green have the greatest variance of these three, sorry, these five. And the purple and the blue are leaning towards having lower minimum eigenvalues, which that may not be the right way to go. So right now I am leaning towards maybe the yellow or the red based off of these two. I think the green is too far to the left here. That's why I'm not leaning towards that. All right, so now let's go ahead and uh, simulate the number of factors that we have. And so here, once again, I'm using the Bayes FM package. I'm doing simulation on number of factors, prior distribution. And this is gonna give us an indication of what the concentration parameter of the Derrick Clay distribution should be. Right, and that is called kappa. So I'm going to try a couple values of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 1 for the kappa value. So that is the concentration parameter for Derek Clay. And I'm going to take a look and see which, which of these look reasonable. All right, so here it gives us a posterior probability on the number of factors. So if I have kappa is equal to 0.1, we can see that's leaning towards one factor. If kappa is 0.2, we can see that it's preferring two factors. If kappa is 0.5, it is preferring two factors, but three is pretty close. And if kappa is equal to one, it is favoring three factors. All right, so there's something to keep in mind that this will, uh, the, the kappa value I give will make the model more prone to concluding like two or three factors. So now let's go ahead and plot it. And so number of factors, and we can see which, it, you know, like the red gives us the distribution of, of the number of factors for 0.1, the green gives us the distribution of the model distribution of factors for when kappa is 0.2 and then similarly for 0.5 and 1. And these are coming from the same values up here. All right, so now I'm going to select the prior parameters. What I'm going to do, I'm going to set the degrees of freedom in the, uh, in the inverse Wishart distribution to 10, that was in the middle, and then I'm going to set kappa to 0.2, and that's the green up here, and which it was once again in the middle. So here, this is, I know that we're going to be leaning towards two factors. And if I go up here, I know that we're looking, you know, we'll, our model fitting will be leaning towards having a, a little bit greater than 0.5 for the maximum correlation and, you know, less than between 0.2, 0.3 for the minimum eigenvalue. 
And now here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to rerun everything with just these two parameters selected. I'm not going to go through all the different ones. That way, it's a little bit easier to see them by themselves. And so I'm just rerunning the code. But now I'm only using one of the degrees of freedom values, the one I picked of 10. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the 0 0.2 kappa. And so here, I can just kind of see what, what, what the distribution is. And so this, my interpretation of this is, I believe that this is the distribution prior to looking to data. That's why it's called the prior distribution. I believe that in this situation, the maximum correlation has a distribution from zero to one with a central tendency being around, let's see, 0.6 or so. And then the, I have a distribution for the minimum eigenvalue, which is, it has a central tendency around 0.2.3. Now we can look at the kappa and we've actually already seen these values. We can see that uh, two factors is gonna be the most prone based off the prior, then one factor, then three, and the prior is leaning very heavily away from having four or five, especially five. It does not think five is a good all right, so now let's actually perform the Bayesian exploratory factor analysis. When I do this, we're gonna take our prior distribution, we're gonna take our data, they're gonna put them together and I'm gonna get new distributions out of this. And it's gonna be called the posterior distributions. And so this that posterior dis distribution gives me a complete representation of what's going on if I want to dig in and start really working with this. Advantage of this is that this is a very complete representation of our data of what the situation is. There is a cost though. There's increased computation time. There's increased risk of non-converting, converging. And it's this is harder to interpret. It takes more time, takes more effort. Now, the burn-in, when I do the computations, the idea here is I'm going to do an iteration and then I'm going to use the, the result of that iteration to improve upon that and get a new iteration, which is even better. And then I'm going to use that to get a new iteration that is even better and keep on doing this over and over and over. The first few can be very wonky, very bad. So I do something called burn in where I uh, run the iterations and I just basically throw them away and they're not included whatsoever. Overall, we're going to have uh, 50,000 observations. So that means we're going to be using 45,000 observations total. Now down here, this corresponds to the uh, prior distribution of the beta distribution uh, involved in this. So by putting 0.5 on each of these, I'm saying I want beta distribution and I don't know what's going on by putting the weight at the, the mass of the density over zero and one. The author used 0.1, I think 0.1 is just fine. I prefer 0.5 because it's not quite so extreme on making a U shape in the distribution. All right, so we can see the, here's some output that we get as the code is running. And we can see somewhere between five and 10%, the burn-in is done. So after the burn-in is over, all the remaining iterations are kept and we can use those. The, all the, the first 5,000 iterations are thrown away and I will never see them. Now these two functions, the post column switch and the post sign switch this goes through and just makes things uh, easier to read, more consistent with the original version of the data. And let's look at the summary. All right, so we set the maximum number of, of factors to five. We uh, restricted the number of variables to, to connecting to a factor to at least two. We did 50,000 iterations, 5,000 of which were burn-in the acceptance rate was one, and then that is after the uh, burn-in period is over, by the way. And so the model says that we should either have three or four latent variables. Well, 91% of them are three and 9% of them are four. So here, this is leaning towards three. Even though my prior was leaning towards two or one, we ended up getting three. All right. So we can see that our data is coming through and speaking in this project. Now here we get the loading. So 
remember, we're getting a distribution on what's going on the under the hood aspect because I'm getting a distribution. I end up getting a, a distribution for all of the variables that are connected to the output that would normally just be one singular value. And so here we can look at the factor loading. So we get a distribution of factor loadings where we have a mean, a standard deviation, and we have a, you know, a 95% interval. We also get something similar for the variances for each of the observed variables. And then we have our correlation matrix and we can look through at each of the uh, entries of the correlation matrix and get an idea of what's going on. All right, so now let's go ahead and plot it. And so we can see, you know, all of these blues connect to times that the model said three factors. All of these are times that the model said four factors. And so we can see that this is much longer, so it's a dominant part. And you'll notice that this starts off after 5,000. Since it starts after 5,000, this that's the part that is uh, the burn in is completely thrown away. I do not look at those. Here are the remaining observations. So here are the posterior probabilities. And so we conclude that, you know, the, that the distribution of, uh, of factors is going to have three as the major player and four is a distant second. Now here we can look at the posterior means to judge should a, uh, an observed variable be connecting to a factor. Well, here we have one, 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 and you know, 0.9 or one. This shows me that things are looking good. Now here are the factor loadings. So here we can judge like how important uh, the connection between a variable and a factor is. And now we can look at the correlation between our factors. So we can see that with the agrees, we have a 0.46 correlation. So there is some correlation there, but it's small. So like for the, like that's small enough that I'm not gonna really worry about it. When it comes to between the agree, the advantage and the disadvantage factors, we can see that it's negative 0.3, negative 0.2, which is pretty small. So I'm feeling good with what we've got. Well, that's all I've got for you. Take care and goodbye.